Yeah, today we kind of follow on from the uh, systems to power and resistance at work. And while this sounds quite rebellious, this is again one of our key theorems that we have actually adopted to manage relationships as a project manager in work organizations and project organization, temporary organization. And as well, you as an employee will probably have similar dynamics in your workplace uh, um, if you get employed in a uh, um, yeah, project-based organization or, or normal company, really. So what, what I want you to kind of look out for is understand the different perspectives on power. So they are really old school theorems of power. And the irony is, if you go on the street and ask people, they will quote you this stuff. It's very intuitional. It's how people perceive power. In reality, we have power in any relationship. Uh, um, so I'll give you a few old definitions, how pa power was perceived and how it's still seen and how it's actually functional to look at it. Uh, so this is what I want you to arrive at. Uh, I want to, to be as well conscious of uh, uh, ideologies that we actually still have. It's like old terminology, again, from my uh, um, uh, um, organizational studies theory. But uh, um, if you look at it, uh, um, the ideology concept is still a very dominant one. And we created non-stop in projects. Yeah, in projects, you too, you will try to build a team spirit yeah, and a culture of mutual support or something like that. Yeah, so it's actually a, a very hard to book, uh, um, concept still nowadays. Yeah? And then uh, I'll show you as well a little bit uh, critical perspectives. And if we have time, I, I want to jump briefly into the culture theorem a little bit more. But again, this is not really priority. You, you have a book chapter on this, and we cover that actually next week as well. This is just a little bit of pity because you will submit your first draft this week, right? On Thursday. Yeah? So just be aware of that. But in the seminar, we look into this. Yeah? How to submit, what the peer review is, and how you get actually 100%. Yeah? So how do we achieve that? Yeah. OK. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, it animated this. Mm, nice. OK. Uh, um, so the initial perspectives on power and organization came really from French and Ravens. And they, they kind of started off with something like five uh, um, types. They, they were hybrid types initially, but uh, um, this is kind of what was left over or still quoted that way. And one is the positional power, derived from a person's position in the organizational hierarchy. Now this too we have in a temporary organization. Who, who is the leader in a project? Who has the power? Decision-making power is here the argument. Manager. Yes, project manager. Yeah, so you too will, by position, uh, um, have power inherent in your role, positioning power. Yeah. Now again, so the decision-making power is with you, but making all the decisions, quite frankly, is timely not really an option, right? So this would be a crazy endeavor. You can try for some time, yeah, but you will upset your team by quite a margin and it will be very exhausting for you. Yeah? So in reality, there's still a situation power uh, um, that you want to probably do your team uh, um, members do their own decisions, right? And you, you may still want to have um, decisions that you're accountable for. Now we have a look at that, and th this is actually quite an interesting one. Now then we have the referent power. Now this is uh, um, actually referring to kind of clerical analysis. So if you read chapter number five, yeah, they, they, they kind of told you where the reference uh, power comes from. It sounds a little bit like reference, but it refers actually to the clerical referent. Did you know what a referent is? It's a, a Christian church thing, really, more than everything else. So uh, um, in, in a Muslim culture or in Islam, you would probably account it to the Muslim. Does anybody know the Muslim? OK, I, I shouldn't go now through all the religions. But the point is, the, uh, you, you have a role of somebody that is a speaker that conveys a message. Yeah? So th this is normally uh, um, perceived as a referent power and uh, um, arguably derived from a person's charisma. Yeah? So if, if you go to a church, you too will meet probably uh, um, a person, uh, a perceived leader of the uh, church community that will try to uh, get in touch with you here, what your worries are, and how we can address this together. Now, the underlying principles of this is actually what became renowned really as a charisma. Nowadays, uh, language, we use it differently. What is charisma to you now? I shouldn't give controversial examples, but here's one. Has anybody ever 
Now, of course, nobody has from you. But I, I when I was a lot younger, I, I thought that a dating web page uh, 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 would be quite interesting to look at. And uh, um, they, they talked as well, what, what is your typical charisma? Yeah, so there, there was one from The Guardian, The Soulmates. Oh, now I've outed myself probably on many levels. And yeah, this is when I was a lot younger. Hello, John. Uh, um, so what, what, what is charisma on a dating web page, potentially? Everybody's puzzled. There's nothing. <laughs> yeah, ch charisma, maybe? Yeah? Yeah? No? Uh, um, so what, what do you associate with charisma? Maybe let's move away from my dating web page. Maybe this is a bad example, yeah? Or, or uh, um, to, to load it. Uh, um, but uh, uh, what, what is a person's charisma? How would you notice it? Ability to talk, yeah, and and in what way? It's just just everybody talking, or to charm someone. <laughs> okay, yeah, charm. So you're quite right, yeah. Charisma had to be with charming, yeah. So being able to relate somebody beyond normal perception, yeah. So you you meet a stranger, and uh, with charisma, he was suddenly a lot closer than you know. He was a stranger. Why why do I feel close to that person? So that, that is where this is coming from. So you, you're spot on. Yeah. And uh, um, now, uh, nowadays we, we still look at this in terms of characteristics. And so if you want to do uh, look at the new form of this in project management, we have characteristics, yeah? character. Yeah? So this is a very weird phenomenon. Empirically, very difficult to test. I, I can tell you this now. If you read it, that's, uh, um, when you think you have a hint, the opposite is often true too or it's not true in certain extent, so yeah, anyway. So referent power, again, uh, uh, a lot of project managers arguably have that. Yeah? So um, you too may become a charismatic uh, uh, leader, yeah? or, or you may be already one. Yeah? Uh, um, then we have the expert power that resides in a person's knowledge and expertise. Um, do, do we have that as a project manager? Expert power. This is as literal as it is expert, right? So, uh, um, yeah, you, you're nodding. Uh, um, uh, example, maybe? Why, why, do, why would we be an expert as a project manager? Or what would be our expertise, if you want, yeah, the, the knowledge uh, that we have? Uh, a lot to take in on the morning, yeah, I, I get that, but uh, uh, yeah. Expert power, what, what could that be? What do we do as a project manager unique from other roles? Making a friend, like a, making a project. Yeah, so, it, it could, so planning could be one, yeah? But uh, um, th this would be just one feature, so you would probably argue that you are the unique experts of uh, bringing a project into life, yeah? And, and running it through. So uh, um, in many other organizations, you will see you have actually roles that are quite consistent and a project is actually a sub-organization or a temporary organization to actually deliver something, right? Or, or change something. Yeah? So this is actually kind of your expertise and associated processes. Now if you go to a project management conference or, or something like this, you will see we have all kind of other expertise yeah, that are refined from there. <coughs> but overall, uh, um, this is already kind of a level if you want. Now we, we have as well a reward power that is derived from person's ability to give and reward to others. So you as a project manager have said again, for your team often, right? And potentially as well partners. So uh, for your external partners, how would we have reward power? That's a tricky one, right? Supply chain, how can we reward them? Is there, is there a reward that comes to mind? <coughs> yeah. yeah, so you, you go already a step further. Let's, let's take them on board, make them a team member. Yeah, this is very good. Yeah, so uh, maybe pre-qualifying for future projects. Um, other elements would be just a recommendation, right? If they have worked well on this project, you can actually say, like, those guys worked well and this was on this project, right? Particularly if it has some prestige or, or leverage, this may be very good. Now, of course, you have reward power as well for the whole project team. 
arguably project managers have the human resource uh, um, uh, career interface for, for the team members. Yeah, so uh, um, you, you have as well the possibilities to recommend your team members. And in many large companies, uh, the project managers uh, try to stick with their team. So if you have team members that you really like working with, we, we have actually phenomena, mm -hmm. and this is, if you study it, you will see a lot of project managers do that. They promote their team with them, or they like to work with the team members that they have learned to cherish uh, and, and uh, work well with. Now, um, the fifth perspective, uh, or uh, fifth type, was the coercive power. Now, this comes really from sociology in its best. So this is the opposite of reward power and punishes others. And, and you may have had that in psychology with Alan Osborn. Did you have uh, um, a group uh, phenomena of power? Power, no? Yes, OK, somebody nods. So, uh, um, so the famous examples here is uh, we, we notice actually that uh, um, coercive power is even dominant in any kind of grouping. So we can even observe this in animals, in humans. So the typical example in monkeys, yeah, uh, um, just to be controversial. I don't know if the study actually really exists in that way, but uh, you, you can test it and analyze it on humans too, and you will see it sticks true. So coercive power, the uh, a typical example, is that you, uh, um, you put one banana in the cage, and uh, um, if the monkey grabs it, you electrocute the cage. So those were medieval kind of uh, um, draconian methods, yeah, but anyway. So the monkey grabs the cage, uh, um, uh, um, gets basically electrocuted by grabbing the banana, but he, the monkeys really like bananas, yeah, so this is all I'm saying. So it's a dilemma. Yeah? If you put two monkeys in, and uh, the one was already electrocuted, and the other one grabs the banana, the first time the monkey doesn't do anything, and both get electrocuted, although just one monkey tried to grab the banana. Now at that point, the monkeys learn grabbing the banana is kind of the electrocuting factor. Yeah? And if you put now a third monkey in that has never been electrocuted, then uh, you, you will see that the two monkeys, as soon as the one monkey goes to the banana, go absolutely berserk and try to basically stop this one ban uh, uh, monkey. And nobody gets electrocuted. Now it's quite interesting. If you now change the monkeys one by one, you can arrive at the position where you have three monkeys in the cage that have never been electrocuted, but attack every monkey that tries to go to the banana and they don't know why. Now that is actually coercive power. It's actually a cultural theorem, and it's pretty dominant. We have this in workplaces, and you, you notice it normally if somebody says like, this is not the way we are doing things around here, yeah? They, they have often not really the full uh, um, understanding why they're doing this this way, but this is just the grown way. Now this is actually a very powerful normative element, and, and we have this as well in projects, yeah? So, uh, um, a coercive power is as well health and safety. Has anybody worked in a factory? Okay, so what, what do you have to wear in a factory? Did you have safety boots and... and uh, yeah, safety boots and uh, gloves and a cap. For hair? Yeah, yeah. For okay, hair. okay. Th this shows we have fine particles. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so, and, and what happened if somebody forgot their safety boots? What, what happens? Uh, he will get a punishment, like uh, uh, a crazy. Uh, Oh, so it's a formal recognition. Yeah, yeah. So this is already when the inspector sees it. Yeah, this is very bad. But what would happen if one of your team members would rock up in, in the normal shoes? What, what would you do as a team member? I will bring into Hello, a Jonas. I will go into a different room, just one by one, and then I will just like uh, give it, uh, give him a check on my shoes, and uh, okay. tell him not to do it again. If I do it again, I will like uh, punish him by the. Like, uh, like yeah. Okay, okay. So yeah, you, you would be actually quite... Act so you, you would see it even if you have one in the team coming on a side or, or factory floor like this, you will see that the teams get stressed out. Yeah, and, and this, this can be even if you don't even go in the factory, if you go only to a team meeting. I have seen this in Nissan. Somebody was like, oh, you don't have your safety shoes on. And it's like, yeah, we, we, we are going with the academic into the room to, to chat. And uh, this was me, basically. And then uh, um, still, there, there was this kind of uh, uh, fear. Yeah? This is a coercive power. It goes deep with us as humans as well. Yeah? OK, so th those were the initial uh, theorems. And they are analytical tools. 
Now, there were two uh, important points about uh, um, their model, and this is at, at for, uh, um, the forms of power overlap. Yeah, so there's not just one. So if you look at the powers from their theory, you have to analyze kind of for uh, nuances or, or combined uh, combinations. Yeah? So as well in teams, you can see that there's probably a, a motive yeah, to respond to uh, um, maybe leadership power, but there's as well a, a coercive power kind of making them want to complete the task together. Yeah? Now, uh, um, and power uh, in this case, particularly in their theory, is actually relational. So um, this is to say someone only has power if a relationship of interdependence exists between power holder and subordinate. So if it's a random stranger walking past, they, they may not correspond or, or have really no intent of doing so, right? So, uh, um, and they concluded from this power is exercised through a dynamic process in which relations of interdependence exist between actors in organizational settings. Yeah, so th it's important that if you have just random strangers, uh, um, maybe nothing happens. Yeah? So you, you can observe this very loose organizations. At a bus stop, you, you are kind of an organization waiting for transport. Yeah, But if it's different buses, you will see it's, it's very half-hearted. So people kind of don't engage, of course, with you if it's not their bus. Yeah, so they step back. It's not a politeness like, I, I know I was in front of you in the queue. But uh, um, this is not my bus, but I'm still in front of you in the queue. Yeah? So this would be actually the conversation that you would have rationally to do, but it doesn't. Yeah? So uh, we don't, or I didn't have said ever. Did anybody have a discussion like that? No, I don't think so. Yeah, OK. Now, uh, there, there were a few more models. So one-dimensional model, this was from Dahl. So he had kind of a, a, um, <coughs> Uh, um, he had a, plural, a pluralist model, so uh, power equitably distributed uh, um, throughout society. Uh, pluralist means basically uh, like grammar. Singular and plural means more. Yeah? Uh, um, and a plural, pluralist model was kind of the recognition that we can actually exercise power in different ways and come to a similar outcome. So you had kind of like a, um, what we would normally describe as a physical model. And there was input, a process, and then an output. But a key point was you, you can actually exercise power in different ways and still arrive at a positive outcome. Now, this is quite interesting with leadership theorems because they often say you have to do this or that. So they have kind of this uh, um, responsive guide, which uh, was actually kind of, if, if you reference him against this, you have done a critical analysis and you're saying like this one model is not very valid. Yeah, there are alternatives. Yeah, so that, that quote would do this, yeah? Now, he had as well behavioral conception. A has power over B to the extent that he or she can get B to do something that B would not otherwise do. And we still observe power like that. If we see a great leader yeah, on the football pitch when Ronaldo dribbles through and plays the pass and somebody heads it in, oh, amazing, he is so gifted, so powerful because he dribbled around this guy, what he would otherwise not have done, yeah? So, uh, um, yeah, maybe it's a little bit too implicit, this example, but the, the point is as well, if, if you, uh, um, so normally we have this with pets. Again, this shows you a little bit where maybe leadership comes in. If a dog is very disciplined and, and you throw a stock, uh, stick and the dog brings it back and lays it in front of your uh, um, shoes, yeah, and then there's a, a dog owner that hasn't got so much discipline with their dog, they think like, oh, look how much control this uh, owner has about their dog in the dormant, yeah while their dog like, basically walks them yeah, actively or something, I don't know. Yeah, so then, then this power is not there. Yeah, you get that. <coughs> then you have the uh, presence of conflict as a, a precondition for the exercise of po power. A group has power when a conflict issue is resolved in its favor. Now, <coughs> here conflict, actually, if you look at this, uh, um, uh, this model was kind of overdone because uh, this, this notion doesn't really hold up to any normal situation because there's always an influx. Yeah. Now we had this well two-dimensional uh, um, model of power. This is kind of Bar Bachach and uh, Baratz. And uh, um, they, they had kind of an interesting one. They had an elitist model. And that was power concentrated with elite groups. So this is again kind of, um, we have said as well with some leadership theorems, right? That, uh, um, that there is a kind of dominance with some people and they are right, uh, rightfully there. And actually, in the, if, if you're following the news and media, 
absolutely blow my mind. There, there was an American politician that claimed that recently, yeah, that there's a good reason that some are wealthy and in power and others are not. Yeah? So uh, he, he is clearly still somewhere in the 20s, 1920s, this is, yeah. So there, there's a 100 years of kind of uh, a discovery mismatch. Yeah, but again, so uh, um, here you have uh, uh, A has power over B when A uh, prevents B from doing something that B would otherwise do. Yeah. So, uh, um, so it's an exercising pow power. And uh, um, here you have two phases of power involves both decisions and non-decisions. So power is exercised through mobilization of bias. Now, what, what is a bias? Do you, do you know any bias? Famous for project management? Anybody heard of optimism bias? Actually, you, you should have that with uh, um, Alan Osborne. You should ask him about biases. Because this sits kind of with the uh, um, psychology or, or project psychology, if you want. Yeah. So op optimism bias, does anybody know what that is? Um, Yeah, this is already, uh, um, yeah, okay, so you, you already, this is a uh, um, relativist view, yeah, so philosophically speaking, you, you actually speak a very accurate description, but this is already quite pessimistic, yeah, so the optimist bias is basically that you blend out what could go wrong, yeah, so you start a project and, and you pitch it to your uh, um, client, for example, and you, you notice that, oh, in the past, 60% of projects have gone wrong that were run that way, but only 60%. Maybe I can make the difference. Maybe I will have the project with the 40% that succeeds. Yeah? And, and this, you are quite rightly. Yeah? So there, there should be a, a relativist view and hmm, maybe I should consider the alternative too. Yeah, but uh, um, here the idea is uh, um, that you're blind to that as a project manager. And we, we see that actually in most project bits. So it's beautiful with things like Olympics, Normally people think that despite all evidence, they will de uh, um, deliver the project within budget, within time, and, and so on. Yeah? And they n never do. Yeah? It's actually impossible. Because it's already kind of pitched towards the political setting. So optimism bias is basically if you cannot uh, distinguish between uh, optimal outcome and negative outcome, because you have a belief for one favoring the other. Yeah? So you are literally blind for the negative side. Yeah? So people may say like, hey, wait a minute, this, this will not work out this way. You, you have a 60% chance of failure. Uh, um, then people are like, no, no, I, I will make it. Yeah. So there, there are many more. We, we have something like uh, 130 biases uh, kind of confirmed. So uh, um, Daniel Kamen, if you're interested in this, has uh, uh, written a beautiful comprehensive book. We have it in the library as well. Uh, that, that one we definitely have in the library. It's our old book uh, from 2006. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, so he kind of talks about different biases. So there's as well, uh, um, if you want to drink fancy wine with your friends, then say like, what, what price are we pitching for? Just say a ridiculous high one. This will make it very likely that everybody else uses this as a benchmark to reason. Yeah. So if you arrive like, oh, today I, I really fancy the 100 pounds bottle, what do you think? Yeah. And then everybody says, oh, whoa. What? Uh, it depends on your friends. Yeah, so my, my friends are like, oh, sh should we not look at 10 pounds? And then I have already pit raised the uh, uh, bargain. Normally it's just house wine yeah, at, at the five pounds per bottle. Yeah, so, uh, um, so this is my strategy. Yeah? So we have multiple biases here. Uh, um, and uh, they, they're inherent in our, uh, um, yeah, in our perception, how our senses actually engage and how we reason and how we perceive. Yeah? So this is actually quite powerful. So mobilization bias is basically the idea that you uh, um, can create an ideal perceived world. Yeah? So uh, um, do I have the creepy examples? <coughs> I think I have a creepy examples were coming. So, uh, um, so the creepy examples uh, um, that, that actually with university, we have kind of turned it upside down. So uh, many students just are interested in the skills rather than the opportunity to learn, to understand the world, yeah, what, what is arguably the endeavor, yeah, if, you, if you believe Alexander von Humboldt, he, he came up with this some time ago, and this, this is maybe the idea, but employers and corporations have convinced you that you're going to university to just get skills. Yeah? And it's, it's very refined as well. So if, if you learn more than skills, then this is actually dangerous. Yeah, if you understand how contracts work, then you're actually very kind of mature employee. You can negotiate with your employer and say, like, hey, come on. 
I, I bring you so much money in, this should be reflected in my payslip, for example. Yeah? So you have completely different notions. Now, this would be, of course, not in the skills profile of the employer. The employer is not so much interested in your understanding negotiation of pay grades, right? So this is important to understand. Yeah? So again, so there's maybe a, um, a mobilization of biases. And this has maybe something to do with who writes the agenda. Um, now, uh, um, they recognize as well that conflict is not a precondition for power. Power works uh, through a suppression of potential conflict as well. So, uh, as well, if you, uh, um, so in university we were all outraged when we had a new skills development framework because we felt kind of slightly offended about it. Yeah? But uh, um, in, in most companies this would be probably celebrated. Now, there's maybe a reason behind that. Yeah? Now then we have a, a three-dimensional model of uh, power. This was by Luke's. Now we are in the 60s and 70s. Yeah? So this was a little bit more refined. So critique of both one- and two-dimensional views of power, as you would as a good scientist. So then power can be exercised where no conflict, either over or covert, exists. Uh, um, what is overt and covert? If I'm on a covert mission, what, what am I? Can yeah. Post. Yeah. So uh, uh, covert is kind of under the obvious. Yeah. So if, if you are, uh, um, so for example, I, I really this is one of our research methods. So I was introduced as a, a consultant to a cluster of companies, and in reality, I was just doing my research. Yeah. But it was easier to talk to the employees, and they, they had all signed against it for ethical reasons. But in reality, they hadn't read it probably. So, uh, um, so there, there, there was a covert uh, uh, exercise, and overt uh, or over is basically the visible. Yeah? Power works as well by shaping and controlling people's wants and beliefs. Yeah? So, do you want this promotion? Then you have to maybe perform your next project with a 15% more profitable performance, and you get the promotion. Yeah? So again. Yeah, then it, it creates maybe, uh, um, you, you see like, oh, this is achievable. Maybe we can do that. And uh, um, if you buy into the promotion scheme, then, then you can go that. Yeah. And then power works as well at a deep structure level, shaping identities, how people view the world. So, uh, um, yeah, actually in project management, we have this very visible. So uh, um, when I started here as a lecturer, this was 2009, yeah? Uh, um, uh, the, my first cohort that finished went into project assistant jobs or uh, um, support team for project manager, a lot of them. Now, uh, four years later, a lot of the project manager cohorts go in graduate schemes where you get very low paid for one and a half years. You see a lot of the company, don't get me wrong, yeah, there's a lot good about it. But it's as well a, a process of uh, um, actually getting you to do a lot of uh, work at lower pay. Yeah? And uh, um, so there, there's always uh, an element of uh, goodness. Yeah? So it's as well a learning environment. But at the same time, you, you are advertising your uh, um, skills and, and potential uh, um, abilities to the teams that you want to work with. So uh, those structural uh, um, uh, uh, tools are actually very, very powerful. And they do shift uh, um, how we get into employment, yeah? or, or how we actually work. Now, um, this, this went further. So uh, from this body of literature, uh, um, there was a uh, um, coming back to ideas and ideology. So ideology and power are closely connected. This is actually going back in time. Karl Marx kind of pointed this out. The ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch of the ruling ideas. So be aware, so stuff like this broad revolution. So th this is maybe on the extreme side. But th there's a, uh, well, it's, it's uh, certainly true. So empirically, we can actually test for that. But uh, um, th there's an element of ideology all this persists. So even if you discontinue with the ideology, you can actually do so based on not wanting to believe in the ideology. But that could be an ideology, too. Yeah, so uh, um, ideology is a link between meaning and power and shaping people's realities and giving a frame for uh, um, is true, good, and possible. And uh, again, if you read that chapter, you will actually see even those terms are brandings. Yeah, this is actually not, so nowadays we, we use it as kind of day-to-day -day language, but they, they came actually a, a long way. And good came from kind of the ruling class, and true came actually from uh, um, 
uh, uh, working class, which is interesting. Uh, so uh, have a look at the uh, chapter if that is of interest. So um, the example here was uh, ideology of individualism. And uh, what, what is individualism? Has anybody come across that? What could that be? So individual, right, and ism. So it's, it's kind of an ideology about being an individual. But what, what, what does that mean? Why does it matter? All in your own beliefs. Yeah. 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 Th this was a big thing. Yeah? In the past, you grew up in a family, and you followed kind of the wishes and traits of your family. Yeah? Th this was a, a communal activity. Yeah? Now, individualism was a treasure hunt, yeah? So if, uh, forget what the, no, it wasn't that extreme, but uh, um, there, there was a notion you can go out and become whoever you want to be, yeah? And be whoever you want to be. It's, it's uh, I think, uh, um, our current zeitgeist uh, um, ethos, right? So th this is still something that motivates us. Now, uh, um, this came at a huge cost, yeah? We, we had a lot of um, social organizations that kind of um, were really constrained by that, yeah? And, and we still see this, yeah? So if you look at uh, demography changing, yeah? if you look at a country like UK, you can see that uh, um, villages or the countryside uh, loses population while the cities grow, yeah? So that, that is actually arguably down to individualism, yeah? Again, so it has its benefits and it's, uh, uh, it has certainly changed the envelope in terms of motives, but uh, um, it's a strong ideology and uh, um, still dominant. Yeah? Ideology is a communication phenomenon, uh, so it operates through communication processes of daily life. So the point is, uh, if, if you can't communicate it daily and you cannot uh, um, get positive feedback, yeah, then uh, um, normally ideologies come very quickly to a hold or, or go into secrecy. Uh, we have now new communication channels as well with uh, YouTube groups or, or online in general. Uh, internet, yeah, so they have kind of reinforced a lot of uh, um, uh, strange phenomena, but uh, um, at the same time, uh, um, it, it actually requires daily confirmation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the controversial one from the book is kind of raised as an example of communicatively uh, uh, constructed ideology. So uh, if, if you look at it and you go with any anthropologist, they will tell you about human race, yeah, and that is pretty much where it ends. Yeah, and then uh, um, you, you have to go really creatively back at looking at, uh, um, I don't know, uh, uh, color or ethnicity and, and, you know, so it's highly controversial and if you look at it anthropologically speaking, there, there's a huge threshold and uh, um, it, it has uh, very little remit. It's a, it's a phenomena that has been used for uh, um, allocating people into groups and uh, as an organizational tool and uh, it's uh, largely suppressive, yeah? And if you stop repeating it, you can see it in certain groupings that only have a concept of, of race, yeah? So it, it's really uh, um, something that has been kind of kept artificially alive. Now, there, there are three functions from ideology. Uh, so it represents particular group interest as uh, um, universal. So this is quite interesting, yeah? So, uh, um, as well, in a project, you probably will try to embrace something like this, that you're all trying to achieve the goals, right? And if you're working on a big project, this may become actually even uh, your universal goal, yeah? But uh, in, in the project, yeah, so be careful uh, um, not to make it a cult or, or ideology, yeah? Uh, um, obscures or denies as well contradictions in society, yeah? Uh, um, uh, and rife uh, social uh, relationships. Or relations. What, what is rifies? Yeah, c connect is a simplified word. Yeah, it doesn't really do the. So it, it, it shapes, if you want, uh, um, uh, social relations as well. Yeah. So they, they are blended with this perspective. Yeah. So uh, what, what is an example? Uh, um, yeah, this is a joke from a, a friend of mine that, that was a product manager as well at the, my previous company. Uh, um, and he always said, it's not uh, um, who you know, but how you know them. And that, that told you a lot about our project management in South Africa. But uh, um, what, what could that refer to? <coughs> <coughs> no, 
Not only the big thing is, right, it's who you know, right? But he said, like, forget about who you know. It's how you know who you know, yeah? But that's complicated, right? So that's <laughs> what, what does he mean? Yeah, he, he was referring to social relationships. Yeah? So he was kind of pointing out, he knew already who he had to know, but he knew him in a different way. So he knew him as, as friends or family members, which kind of uh, suggests a lot of other power dynamics. Yeah? But the point is, this is still very true nowadays. Yeah, so the, the idea of, and, and you will see that in business relationships, in project management, we too try to build relationships meaningful that we are enjoying being in the work environment. Yeah? So may, maybe even to a, a level that we have friends. And, and this is where we're kind of uh, um, this dimension comes from, from ideology as well. Uh, but ideology also involves a process of struggle in which dominant meanings and realities are resisted and sometimes transformed. So there is as well, uh, um, you can as well overthrow ideologies if you uh, create a counter movement. Yeah? Uh, um, yeah, just from a power lens, uh, um, uh, so the uh, critical theory really deals with that a lot. So critical scholars uh, study organizations as sites of power and resistance as an ideological uh, struggle over meaning. So again, uh, um, a lot of you probably associate here the old school kind of uh, um, theorems, but nowadays we still do this. Yeah? So we have a look at how we can actually improve our project organization rather than creating games of struggle. Yeah? And uh, um, so this was, for example, the move from traditional planning and cost accounting with a lot of hard, hard tools to looking actually at our teams trying to motivate having a conversation, planning within the future, that they can actually have a, um, yeah identity within the organization. Yeah? So this was actually absent in project for a long time. And this is actually, uh, um, yeah, if you want, uh, uh, a struggle uh, um, that, that was addressed with that. Yeah? It's as well how do a different communication practices play a role in the ideological stru uh, struggle. And it's as well a role of hegemony. So we, we had that in the uh, um, second session. Hegemony as kind of an uh, overpowering element, yeah, operates when taken for granted system of meanings that everybody shares functions in the best interest of the dominant group. Yeah, and in, in projects, we, we certainly do so uh, to an element to the client, right? So we, we are kind of trying to, to deliver our project according to client spe specifications. Or depending on your project setting, you, you may have a user that kind of uh, um, uh, explicifies their interest. But we, we are certainly uh, at a dominant form ourselves as project manager. Yeah? Um, oh, I still have the, yeah, okay. So there, there are some, uh, this is a, again an old school uh, uh, machine tool factory uh, um, example. Uh, but I, I want to jump that actually. So uh, ideology and hegemony work together by creating a sense of identification between employees and their organizations. Control most effective when a sense of weakness exists. So this can be team spirit, yeah, this can be a, a project culture, this can be as well something like a company culture. Yeah? Company values, if you're subscribing to it, then you're doing already a great deal in kind of establishing a very powerful identity building theory. Now then you have as well the identification not inherently problematic, only so when a company prioritizes efficiency and profit over well-being of employees. And this is kind of where the biggest story comes from. So particularly in projects, we are often targeting efficiencies, delivering, we are actually kind of a separation from the uh, um, permanent organization if you want to deliver something in time according to budget, right? with success criteria, with the benefits that the company wants. So there's often strategic intent. And it's very easy to kind of lose out on the well-being of employees. Yeah, so uh, um, projects have the uh, um, danger of fatiguing the team, of fatiguing even the project manager. Yeah, be aware of that. Now, OK, so this was a lot of theoretical stuff. Before we start with deeds, I, I thought we, we do a small case study so I brought you a case study. It's like kind of this is a case study, yeah. And then I have some questions for you. So have, have a look. Go through it.
So this is a, a IT company in Cambridgeshire, and uh, um, they are quite popular. We have two students there that went there after graduating. And uh, um, yeah, the company still exists. They have actually franchised, they have grown. Yeah. And uh, um, yeah, have, have a look what you make of the company. Yeah, so this is, uh, um, as a graduate, you go in the company and you work from day one. You get fully paid. So have a look if this is uh, interesting or not. Does everybody have a copy? Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, see what you are making of this. So if, if we look at our uh, power theorems before we even had the ideology, uh, um, hi, hi, hi. let's go with the first one. What, what is the exercise uh, um, power here? Do we have any positional power? Hierarchy? No. Well, in, in the snippet. So they, they have a hierarchy, but it's not visible, right? So where, where, where is the emphasis set in that organization? Perhaps reward. Yeah, reward power. Yeah? And hence, they have a strong coercive power. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. The teams want to be successful. Otherwise, they don't get their rewards. Yeah, do, do you see that? Yeah. So they, they will have a very strong, com this is why it is such an evolving uh, um, or, or dynamic company. Yeah? So if you play with this very strong, you have a consequence. Yeah? You, you want people, they probably came for that reward. Uh, if you don't make the rewards and benefits, then people will be like, why, why did I come to this company in the first place? Yeah? So uh, anyway, I hope that makes sense. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, and the weenus makes probably as well sense, so that there's a, a lot of it uh, with it. Now, uh, um, if you actually come from the ideology lens further, then you come to uh, uh, Deeds, and he has actually, or oh, he was the example that came up with the um, corporate colonization, and that was that uh, um, we have actually arrived, surprisingly, at a, a um, culture where we have nearly a corporate view of our world. So this is corporation as a dominant institution in society. Well, actually, what, what is a corporation? Or what is corporate? Or what does that mean? Business. Yeah, business uh, go, goes in the right direction. But how, how is a corporate different from uh, my, my small corner shop that I started yesterday. A big business or a lot of businesses with the same philosophy? Yeah. So uh, corporate is kind of the notion that you have a uh, um, uh, multifaceted, or, well, I shouldn't go too much into the uh, um, definition, but it's an uh, organization that has a certain size and leverage and certain power dynamics in society. Yeah. So they can actually, uh, um, arguably, corporates are negotiating with even democracies or nations on a, a, a representative level. Yeah? And you will see that in many countries. So even in the UK, we have a representative uh, um, democracy. Uh, and it, it means that uh, um, companies will actually negotiate on policies in, in the uh, um, national economy of England. Yeah? Now, okay, so uh, Dietz actually pointed out that this had so much influence so that we actually uh, um, see now uh, um, a lot of our uh, um, yeah, uh, views uh, um, of our daily life uh, through um, the lens of institutions, so the corporate uh, ones. And uh, um, so institution means it's something that is taken for granted, unquestioned. Yeah? So typical institution as a police, if the police tells you, Hey, don't steal the bike from Robert, yeah? Then you, you should stop, yeah? So if you keep doing, then the police is probably interfering, I hope, yeah? So anyway, but the, the point is that uh, um, the, the police is accepted as somebody that tells you this, so if somebody else comes past and says like, hey, stop stealing this bike, and it's a random stranger, you may decide to still stop 
uh, stealing isn't good in the first place. Uh, it's probably a bad example. But the, the point is we, we have institutionalized some people that kind of reflect that. And we accept them kind of a face value or uniform value. <coughs> they have to have a uniform on who we are like, okay, this is hard. <coughs> Now, then we have this way, uh, corporation shape all spheres of life. So we, we have kind of, uh, this is actually still mind-blowing thing. We, we have actually refined our life with business products, consumption goods. Yeah, this is very different to what we had uh, before. And corporations uh, um, have as well started shaping our beliefs, values, and meaning of uh, meaning systems. That is our very sense of uh, identity of human beings. Yeah, and uh, um, there, there's some proof of it. Uh, um, so, yeah, shall, shall I go into example? No, uh, let, let's just push on because otherwise we run out of time. So, sphere of education is one example of a realm where corporation uh, uh, colonization appears. Uh, um, and I, I mentioned this. Yeah, so ideally you should be here to, to learn about the world, being curious, understand what you want to do in the future. Uh, but again, this is very idealized. This is kind of something that uh, um, was idealized uh, when it came to the discovery of the world, when we realized that there's a lot of different uh, um, systems, when we discovered the bacteria, that there's a small world that we can hardly see with our eyes, things like that. Yeah? Then the, the, this kind of led to the idea that education is about discovery, what you want to do and what you're curious about. Yeah? But now we have actually come full loop. Yeah? So our MSc of project management gets as well assessed from international corporations on the skills that you are learning here. Yeah? And uh, you too uh, um, probably have an interest in having a certain skill set from this MSc degree, uh, which is kind of changing the envelope. So you're doing actually what the companies are dreaming of. Uh, you, you're kind of developing the skills for them. Yeah. Now that, that is kind of what deeds meant. Yeah. So it sounds quite grim. In a way, it's quite functional and pragmatic as well. So there is a certain element of it, but it's a it's a strong thing. Yeah, and uh, um, it's a very powerful tool. Now deeds uh, um, continues this actually. So workplace is critical site of human identity creation. So we, we have things like engineering culture, even product management culture. I should have actually rewritten this. But uh, it's a, s a study of normative uh, ideological control in a high-tech company. So uh, culture is engineered by company to maximize profit. Uh, um, so in, this is not always true. So in, yeah, sh should I refine that? So sometimes it's about profit. Sometimes we have otherness. Yeah? So I, I work for a big American company. And we have this uh, um, internal rate of return. So uh, um, in this company, we were already enormously profitable. But we had other aspirations of growth. Yeah? So we were actually trying to expand the market. So particularly when I worked in South Africa, Pe PepsiCo existed kind of in the north, in Egypt. Then there was a, a big thing in Nigeria and Ghana. Yeah? And then there, there was a long time nothing. And then there was South Africa. Yeah? This was PepsiCo in Africa. When we arrived there, the, the small intent was to kind of uh, um, uh, um, yeah, get everybody a, a fun beverage. Yeah? So this was a party line from Pepsi. So we would literally go from country to country to expand the whole market. Yeah? So you wanted every country to enjoy the pleasures of Pepsi. Yeah? Well, this was the Pepsi brand. So there was this word Frito-Lay, Burger King, you, you name them. Yeah? So uh, uh, Tropicana, yeah? orange juice. Uh, or, or sparkling water, my favorite one. Yeah? But, uh, anyway, the, uh, um, the, the, the point is, this is then uh, um, a, a view where you not just want to be profitable, but you are happy to take a, a provisional loss and kind of compensate it as a whole continent unit to kind of grow yeah? and, and to create values that uh, people want to belong to. Now, this is playing extremely with Dietz's notion of culture. Yeah? So this is very, very powerful stuff. Now, um, there's as well aspects of self uh, uh, traditionally deemed private uh, coming under corporate control, uh, co-opting employee uh, emotions, values, and beliefs. So actually, this is what I experience, yeah? And it, it's, it, it's powerful, but if you look at it critically, it's actually quite heartbreaking, yeah? So there, there's a double-edged sword to that. Now, there, there is as well an element of resisting corporate culture. This is resistance by workers uh, can undermine the process of corporate colonizing or um, the hidden resistance of uh, flight attendants. This is 
this is a very strange example. If you read it in the book, it's even slightly uh, more stranger. So, uh, um, what was it? Has somebody read the case study? Is it PA, uh, British Airways, or, or is it? It's, it's one of the big ones. Uh, um, I've forgotten which one. Uh, we, we can just take Singapore Airlines because it's certainly true there. I have uh, witnessed this recently. So, uh, um, Flight attendants uh, engage in emo emotional labor. So uh, um, you, you will notice if you get in the plane, the stewardess or steward will smile at you and it's all about kind of creating a nice atmosphere for flying, right? Because uh, if, if you think about it, the transport of flying is actually quite terrifying. So they create this wonderful calming environment, right? This is part of their kind of job role. So, and uh, carefully manage public presentation of the self to produce a positive feeling to the customer, so this is the idea. And uh, um, what's interesting is you, you will still see that they often smile, but in their own interpretation. So if you actually analyze their smile, they, they have managed to have the uh, lips up, but at the same time, the eyes are not smiling anymore, right? And it's a coping mechanism, because otherwise they would probably get uh, insane, to be honest. But, uh, oh, it's very tough, right? So uh, and, uh, th this is kind of their uh, um, micro uh, level of resistance, if you want, or at least Dietz claims this, right? And then uh, corporate ability to control emotional labor of flight attendants is incomplete, of course. Yeah, it's, it's very, it's nearly impo impossible. And uh, um, yeah, this was kind of, uh, okay, we, we actually uh, uh, miss you a lot. But uh, one wonderful example as well in this case study is their clothes. So they have a formal uniform but if you have ever flown, you will notice they have all their own interpretation. So one has the formal uh, skirt on and, and the other attendant the, the uh, um, trousers maybe. Yeah, but then they have their personalized scarf or something yeah, to, to be a little bit unique. So uh, in a way, they kind of uh, play with this uh, um, to, to still have their individuality, which kind of is actually attempted to be kind of corporate, uh, uh, well, corporate in, in Singapore Airlines at least. Yeah. Now, um, the, the case study gives you a few ideas. Uh, we, we have certainly more of that in the project management environment. So we, we have actually a lot of resistance. Yeah, so if, if you see, uh, um, if you work with contractors or, or specialist contractors, they often try to play with flexible timings for your project delivery to optimize their project-based organization performance, right? Does that make sense? So if you are a specialist contractor and you, you have a time slot of 10 days on a, a project site to do a job, right, then you will optimize that to uh, actually do that job when you have a job nearby or, you know, when it fits into your schedule. Now, this is not opti necessarily the optimal schedule for you as a project organization, right? As a project organization, the past job that needed to be critically finished uh, um, is finished, then you want the... Uh, specialist contractor to come on site and do the job, right? But there's very little incentive for him to do it. Yeah? Unless it overlaps with his scheduling. Yeah? So we, we then play sometimes with pricing and other mechanisms, but uh, ha have a look at that example. So the mechanisms are actually uh, recognized. Now here it was really largely about resistance to gender hierarchy and status. So this was quite interesting. Then resistance to regulation of movement and space. Actually, I, I think it, it was uh, British Airways, and what was in interesting was that uh, stewardesses were initially meant to be female. Uh, then they, they kind of dropped that, and uh, um, gender was kind of neutralized. But again, this is kind of a case study over time. Yeah? So uh, um, resistance to regulation of movement and space as well, and resistance to regulation of appearance. That, that was the last one. So you, you have kind of uh, um, yeah, underlying mechanisms there. So, uh, conclusion, if you want, from at least uh, uh, um, yeah, the, the power dynamics and control, it's impossible to understand organization communication without understanding the complexities of power that you're actually employing. And uh, um, with understanding the power involved, uh, um, you can as well kind of uh, um, counterbalance struggle. Uh, so you can create a meaningful environment and certainly uh, um, even predict uh, um, potential behavior that you're getting back here if you're playing with those tools. So what can you, uh, communicative uh, sources you can use as well? So here, stories, rituals, and metaphors is a very strong uh, um, element. 
Has somebody done that? Has somebody uh, used in their paper a story of their past? Has somebody described past experience or something like that in, in the paper? Yeah? You, you are nodding? Yeah? So th this is actually very, very powerful. Uh, um, stories and rituals and metaphors to understand uh, um, how you view the world. Yeah? So the, the, it's a very strong analytical tool. Uh, um, and, and it gives you an insight uh, on how your organization ma members utilize or struggle uh, over meaning or, or what they're actually doing. Yeah? This can be quite extreme. Yeah? So again, this is a conceptual level, but uh, th this goes really deep. It, it comes maybe even to a point where they don't get the perspective of the project manager yeah? because they are so focused on their narrow field. Yeah? Okay, where, where are we? Um, 17. Oh, we, we can go for culture then. This is very good. Okay. So last session, I, I didn't actually make it to the culture setting. And so uh, um, today we have a chance to catch up on this. This is really the historical context again, where the cultural approach came from. Now, culture has been a, a long time around. So this is thanks to anthropology, uh, really, that we kind of discovered culture, or that there was no better way, really, to, to look at uh, different communities of people, how they organize themselves, other than uh, coming up with something like culture. Uh, then there, there's the understanding of the idea of culture as a metaphor for analyzing organizations. And then as well, last but not least, being able to compare and contrast the pragmatist and purist perspectives on organizational culture. Now, um, the emergence of cultural approach uh, came, as I said, from the, uh, um, yeah, uh, uh, anthropology, but uh, initially came after the age of the bureaucratic organization. So this was again Weber's concept, right, that bureaucracy allows democratic, unbiased uh, decision making based on clear uh, role allocation. And this was kind of in the 70s, so here we saw great economic and political instability. So this is normally when we reinvent the work organization or look at new tools for our management uh, um, toolbox, if you want. Yeah. Here you had a crisis uh, in management and labor relations, uh, partly, uh, um, but uh, there was already an, a professionalized uh, um, uh, culture actually in that time. So you had an increased global competition as well for US firms and a rejection of bureaucratic form as a conformist alienating work environment. Uh, um, ha has anybody worked in a uh, um, bureaucratic environment where you had to for fill forms every time when you wanted to do something. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I, I live in one, yeah. It's uh, in university we really like bureaucracy, or particularly our research councils do. So they, it, it, it's mind boggling, yeah. So you have a form failure in the uh, uh, template, uh, in the bureaucratic form. So you have like slipped under the line, and you wrote there something, then they just reject the proposal on that basis. You're like, no, but all the information was right. It's just the date has slipped down. And uh, um, they, they will ask you to resubmit, and they will consider it in the next committee. Yeah? So you're waiting like half a year or something like that. So it's, it's, uh, you, you really lose a, uh, no, I shouldn't go too drastic, but uh, it's frustrating as, if things like that happen. So, uh, um, and again, as a German, I should celebrate bureaucracy, yeah? but uh, that, that's the side of the topic. Yeah? So um, with this came as well uh, um, the desire for a new approach to organize and reflect uh, on the greater complexities of life. So there was a recognition that uh, um, people have like an identity and, and that they are too focused on uh, bureaucracies or, or proud of that. And this really brought the concept of culture as a new and vivid way of understanding organizational life. life. So here you had the focus not on variables and efficiency, but on everyday communication processes. So how can we enable actually uh, better uh, progress? And the origin of metaphor in the field of anthropology. Uh, um, uh, yeah, okay, I said that already. And the role of interpretive tradition. So this is again uh, philosophically grounding it. Now, uh, this is where Greets uh, um, came in with the finish of culture. Man is an animal of suspended and webs of significance that he himself has spun. So it's an idea that as people, as we engage with the world, we make meanings, but we create as well our ties. So if you hang out with friends and you, you experience something and you, you kind of describe it to each other, this is where meaning is created as well. 
Now, again, philosophically speaking, uh, um, you, you look here at semiotic, meaning-centered view of culture. So this is like how do we use words? So we had that already. This is quite dry, actually. But again, very powerful if, if you do the analysis. Yeah? So you can work here with duality. What is actually the opposing example to, to words? Then webs of significance are created by people and then act uh, back on them. Yeah, so, uh, um, so a typical example is like, uh, um, who, who is your charismatic leader in your company? Uh, well, what is he renowned for? What, what do you like in the work environment about him? Uh, if you do an analysis like this, you will actually see that there are certain elements that seem more significant. Yeah? So, uh, um, yeah, so as a project manager, junior project manager, you may look what a senior project manager does to get always the most prestigious projects or the big projects. Why, why does he always get those? Why do you not get them? Uh, and then you may see that there is something about the relationship uh, between the senior project manager and the director, maybe making the case how you as a project manager solve the complexities of this big project. Yeah? So there, there may be a web of significance that comes into play with that. Yeah? Then this is where the analysis of culture is an interpretive process, not an experimental uh, uh, science. So cu culture just works by its practice. So uh, um, if, if you uh, observe culture within a grouping and you kind of replace the group into something else, you will get something else. It's kind of implicit, yeah? So it's not a, a pure empiry that is predictable. Um, and there is a focus on sick description. Now, if you understand a the culture, then, so this is slightly creepy and, and Normally this sounds a little bit like you're a spy, yeah? So if, if you are now an agent, not from the culture, but you have read the sick description and you understand how to communicate, there is an empirie that you will fit in a lot easier and that uh, you will be accepted by the other people a lot easier. Now at the same time, there's a certain creepiness about this, yeah? If you have built up your culture with your friends and there's somebody else coming along has the same language and says like, yeah, yeah, I've been there, yeah, then, uh, um, it feels kind of fake, yeah? So there, there's an interesting dynamic, but still, this is one of the most powerful tools, yeah? So, uh, um, again, so this is sick description. Uh, so the lens of culture focuses on ways that people communicatively construct systems of meaning and shape and embody these beliefs and values. So it's for the artifact, uh, uh, um, in any football fans here? Okay, very good. Uh, lo local team or, or other team? No, not a team. I'm from Norwich. Okay, so you, you have a team there, yeah? yeah. Uh, um, is, is there like a, a oh, this is a risky. Uh, so is there a hymn, uh, a hymn that you have when you are in the stadium that you sing? No, not really. Oh, okay. Okay, I give you one. That, me, yeah. yeah. So okay, it's not a problem. So uh, I come from Berlin and and uh, um, from a particular district, and my team is as well incredibly small. So our hymn is. Uh, uh, Actually, uh, one that you have to know. So, if, if you're in the fan corner and you don't uh, loudly sing along, they, they will be like, I don't think he's one of us. Yeah, yeah? so the, this is the other side of culture. Yeah, you will, will be picked out. And, and the song is pretty terrible. It's, uh, um, it's in the south of Berlin and it's where they make lime oil. Yeah, so we are from the south of Berlin and uh, we are. We have the best lime oil and something else, yeah. So and, and the best team, yeah. And it's like, yeah, at least everybody knew we do lime oil. You know, the, I can see that the lime oil company was very happy with this hymn, yeah. Uh, um, but the point is, <laughs> we, uh, so from a culture perspective, th this is as well an association, right? And a silly song like this in a fan block gives you a relaxed time, and people will, you know, clap your shoulder and be like, yeah, it was a terrible game. Uh, my, my team normally terrible game, yeah. So when it's a draw, we're like, oh, it wasn't that bad. Yeah? So this is, we, you have to have a lot of optimism as well. Too. But uh, um, the, the point here is that uh, you, you belong. Yeah? So you, you are part of this culture. Yeah? So it's quite, quite mind-boggling, mind actually. Yeah? And uh, yeah, so this is uh, taken for granted. Norms that guide your everyday life are kind of part of that. Yeah? Now, there are as well two different perspectives on how to examine organizational culture, and I have this on the next one. One is the pragmatist approach, and this is popular in management uh, uh, um, theory. So this is probably what you will have with Alan and Bichel. So um, here, culture is an organizational variable. Culture is something an organization has. 
Culture is key in increasing employee commitment. A manager's role is to engineer culture to meet organizational uh, corporate goals. And I did this as well with PepsiCo. Yeah, so this would be facilitation, asking people what is important about their work, what they want the product to stand for, then you write it down, and you know people can identify because you have it from them. Right? So you create strong identity with this, and you will see people come happy to work. Yeah. So it has its benefits. Yeah? And if you link it then with benefit schemes and, and meaningful elements that kind of are essential for the employee's life, you have created a binding organization. Yeah? So it's, it's not really surprising, right? So in a, in a way, you, you can use it that way. But again, uh, um, there's a, oh, well, actually this is continued, strong connection between culture and organizational performance. This is true. It's not always more efficient, but people are generally more committed. So they kind of look strategically out as well. Uh, which is actually very powerful. And culture exerts uh, um, ideological control. Uh, members internalize the values of the organization, and you will see this. Uh, th this is a really big thing, actually, all over the world. Normally, everybody has now uh, uh, company values. And uh, um, yeah, there is as well a prescriptive view of culture. Our goal is to create a strong, effective cultures for the organizations. And uh, some of the most famous ones are probably companies like Red Bull, kind of uh, um, lifestyle companies. They, they have really kind of chipped into this. And if you speak to employees, they are normally very much uh, like that. Google is another famous one if you're interested in this phenomena. Yeah, so uh, the Googliness. Yeah. Have, have a look at jobs of Google. Uh, there's a whole uh, um, narrative around that. Now that, that is the one. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, functions of the culture as well include uh, creating a shared identity among members, uh, a great generating employee employee commitment and enhancing organizational stability and serving as a sense-making device. Yeah, so here, here you look as well after your other employees and you find social mechanisms to kind of enlarge probably the, the scope of normal organizations. Now on the other side we have the purist approach and this comes really from ethnographic uh, um, research and anthropology. Here, uh, culture as a root of metaphor, an organization is a culture, so it's not so much about trying to play around with it, but you really try to understand what makes this culture tick. And this is as well very powerful if you do understand it. So organizations only exist through members, everyday communication processes, rejection of idea that culture can be engineered. So you, you may have active players that try to kind of create subcultures, but uh, um, this is kind of part of the cultural phenomena. So the purist approach, elements of purist approach are a broader conception of organization and use of ethnographic methods. So uh, um, in the seminar, after we work through the, uh, um, through the uh, um, uh, yeah, peer review and how to submit everything, we have a short uh, um, study of an ethnographic study of leaders, yeah. What what makes good leaders, and uh, um, yeah, you, you will see this. Uh, uh, the uh, researcher actually did an ethnographic study, which means he includes himself in the community of the culture that he's studying. He imitates the culture, although he naturally is not part of the culture. Yeah. So this creates strange phenomena. Yeah. So this is me bringing a friend along to my football uh, team, and he tries to sing along with the song. Because I, I've taught him quickly before the game, okay, you just have to sing along, then, then it's a great experience. If you don't sing, we will be cornered out, we have to leave the block, yeah? Something like that, yeah? So, uh, um, so and, and this is what ethnographic methods are about, yeah? So, um, here you have a swear study of organizational symbols, uh, talk, and artifacts. Uh, what, what are symbols? What is, this, uh, what is a symbol? Uh, um, when we interact, do, do we have symbols in projects? Uh, you, you have some actually below, but uh, what, what is the symbol maybe? A flag? Yeah, a flag, that's very good, uh -huh. yeah. A brand in plane, right? Are other symbols? What is a symbol symbolic gesture? Has anybody come across this? No problem. Yeah. Okay, this was just me doing weird movements. But uh, uh, any, any symbols? No. 
Okay, uh, uh, has everybody been here on a plane before? Fr from Newcastle? Well, we have here a specific trait that doesn't exist on all airports, but we have somebody that does this. Yeah, you may not have seen it. Uh, this, this is normally only on the sides when they start the turbines, so that the uh, poor person doesn't get blown away. But uh, uh, then they do something. So this is basically symbol. Well, so you, symbols are a representation of uh, um, something, yeah? and, uh, and, and often it's a communicative device. Then talk is kind of talking, and artifact is normally physical or, or uh, um, virtual parts. So an artifact can be as well. Uh, um, a mailbox uh, full of emails or something like that. Uh, but uh, again, this is very specific. So normally this is relevant constructs, facts, practices, vocabulary, metaphors, and rites and rituals. Well, what is that? Rituals? Here in university you can think of the, uh, um, what, what, what are the rituals? I hope there are not too many. Uh, so if it's formal ones, then uh, maybe may okay, but uh, Oh, we, we all have this, but rites and rituals, what is this? Sleeping. Yeah, C can be, yeah, it's, it's one. Sleeping, yeah. <laughs> Following code. Yeah. Following code? Yeah. Yeah, Gu guidelines, policies, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, but uh, I hope the other ones uh, are clear, so this is good enough for me. So the, the important notion to take away is a uh, um, pragmatist approach kind of has this view of proactiveness, which kind of leaves you, for example, as a project manager, creating the culture out of it, which is a strange thing. Yeah, so it's not really true, because of course you have this very kind of perspective. So but uh, with the purist uh, approach, we, we actually come to a sick description. And again, this is more powerful if you want to understand the culture. So if you come in a new company and you have a sick description of it, it's very easy to fit in. And so if you have from Redgrave the sick description, then you will have a very easy walk through there. Yeah? Because you will have an understanding of the social uh, um, dynamics and as well cultural dynamics. Yeah? Okay. So uh, summarizing the cultural approach, neither the pragmatist or purist uh, approach is more correct. Each pers perspective provides a different lens on organization life. Pragmatist is more managerial approach, concerned with performance. Purist researcher approach is concerned with complexities of organization life. And cultural approach as an eye-opening approach to organizational communication. And, and we have in the seminar in the second half uh, a beautiful case to look at leadership. Yeah? And, and you have to tell me if, well, initially the uh, um, we will hear the ethnographer and, and what he thought of the management dynamics, but we will have a look afterwards uh, um, in, in how far the culture was purist or, or pragmatist. Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, let, let's stop at that point. Do you have any questions so far? Okay, this was a very quick run through. So culture, very uh, um, a big topic. You may have picked it for your uh, um, paper as well. Uh, make sure that you uh, refer to the book chapter if you haven't done so already. Yeah? Uh, because uh, um, culture, if you look at psychology, is actually a different definition. Yeah? Okay. Qu questions? Observations? Cultural examples that you want to share? Yeah? Is it how to specifically use a cultural approach? 